Well, I invite you to take your Bibles with me and turn in them to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We have transitioned a bit for a few weeks over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 because we need to understand biblical love. Biblical love. Real love is a foreign concept to most in our world. Um, that includes, actually, and unfortunately, the average evangelical world, in fact, that biblical love is a foreign concept. Of course, the world doesn't know and understand what love is because the world has rejected the one who is love. They have rejected Jesus Christ. But also, many within the evangelical world don't understand biblical love simply because they have adopted a definition of love that either the world has given to them and they accept that definition of what love is, or they just refuse to understand what the Bible says about it. The definition of love that the world gives is less than what God gives. It is an aberration of what God tells us love is. And far too often the evangelical world seemingly and really shockingly absorbs it and takes it as if it is what they ought to be doing. In fact, as we have been studying this reality from the sermon of Jesus in Luke chapter 6, the depth of biblical love is profound beyond measure in reality when you think about it, if not for the simple fact that Jesus commands you and I who are followers of Jesus Christ to love our enemies. Love our enemies, he says, do good to those who hate you. And in the following verse, he takes it even further and says, bless those who curse you, pray for those who who mistreat you. The word mistreat is revile. Those who revile you. Those who do all kinds of things against you. Now that is both a high calling and it is an impossible calling if those who are attempting to live out the concept and reality and principle of love that the Bible commands, if you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it is impossible. You cannot do it. You cannot even begin to do it. It is impossible for those who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith to live out what Jesus Christ commands to love one another. You cannot do it. You cannot love your enemies. You will not love your enemies. You will not do good to those who hate you. You will not bless those who curse you. And you certainly will not pray for them because God doesn't even hear the prayers of the wicked. So if you do not know Jesus Christ by faith, if you are here today and you claim to believe upon Jesus Christ and yet you have not repented of your sin, place your faith in Jesus Christ whereby his righteousness is imputed to your life, then you are not a Christian, you are a fraud and you cannot live out what Jesus Christ says. You must embrace Jesus Christ. So it's an impossible calling for the unbeliever. And yet it is a very high and difficult calling for the believer because we often succumb to sinful responses. And so it's helpful for us to know what biblical love looks like. It's helpful for us to actually think through this in a, in a greater depth since we are commanded by Christ to love our enemies. <coughs> and 1 Corinthians 13 gives us a biblical picture of what love looks like. It tells us two different ways what love is. It tells us three different ways what love is not. It tells us five ways what love does not do and five ways what love does. So 
before us here, written by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church, beginning in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13, and going down all the way through the first few words of verse 8. I want to just read these for us, just as, so we can have them in our minds. Paul says, love is patient. Love is kind, is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Let's pray. Father, your words here are so sharp. You tell us that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing down to the thoughts and intentions of the heart. These words certainly divide the thoughts and intentions of our heart, exposes the very reality of what we think and how we act, shows us exactly how we are to be, what it means to be an imitator of you, for you in every way fulfilled each and every detail of what this text tells us perfectly, without fail, for enemies like us. We are called to live in that way. We are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thereby love our neighbor with as ourself. And here we are face to face with what that love looks like. Lord, may it be reflective in our life, reflective in our words and our thinking, reflective in our actions towards one another so that the world might know that we are your disciples, that you are indeed the Lord God, that you are the one that all men will face. Teach us to love like that. In Christ's name, amen. First John chapter 4, verse 16 tells us that God is love. God is love. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ and God the Father are one. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. We know that God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are equal. They are one God. The Bible tells us that if the word or if the world is going to know that we are followers of Jesus Christ, then they will know it. Through our love for one another, John 13, 35. They will know that you are my disciples when you have a love for one another. The Bible commands us as followers of Jesus Christ to love in the same way that Jesus has loved us, John 13, 34. Jesus says, as I have loved you, you love one another. And the world will know that you are my disciples as you love one another. And so here in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, we get a clear picture of what this kind of love is in practice. So the whole point of why God, the Spirit, has led the Apostle Paul to put these words on the page is so that you and I, as hearers of the word, would be appliers of the word. Remember Jesus' words in, John, or in Luke 6, verse 27, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Are we hearers? If we're hearers, then we will be doers. And this is the whole reason. It is because love never fails. Far too often we think love fails because we think that way, and I can say we think that way because we don't love. 
We must think that way, that love must fail. Love isn't what it takes. Love won't accomplish the task. Love won't do what I think it ought to do because I'm responding in such a way that isn't loving. Therefore, we're saying to God, love doesn't work. And yet here God is saying, love never fails. The Corinthian church had forgotten that truth. They were at each other's throats. They were bickering with one another. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them wanted some kind of prominence in the church. They, saw, they wanted some kind of place, some kind of platform in which others would look to them and others would see them and they would be the one to whom others would go to and clamor for. Chaos was reigning in the Corinthian church because each person was attempting to overstep everyone else. There was no love happening there. There was a corporate deformity. It was a church, but it was a deformed place. And the deformity was happening and, and taking place within the church because the exercise of love wasn't happening. There wasn't love going on with the people in the church. And so the Apostle Paul drops this bomb right in the middle of all of their ugliness. And he says, I want to show you a more excellent way. It's the way of love. So this, this beloved, is a beautifully crushing passage. It crushes our heart. Many of you have even come to me this last week and said, man, that... that what was said last week has just been penetrating upon me. And I just smile because I say, thank you, Lord, for not letting me be the only one to bear all of it. Because <laughs> it's been graciously crushing upon my heart. And yet, it is a gloriously maturing passage if we will simply Receive it and apply it. I know you ladies buy shampoo at the grocery store. Have you ever read the back label? The back label of all your shampoos always says this. Repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, right? Apply, rinse, repeat. Now they're doing that because they want to sell more shampoo to you, right? <laughs> And yet this is what God is saying to us. We must take this passage, we must receive it, we must apply it, and we must repeat it again. And receive it and apply it and repeat, and receive it and reply it and repeat, and receive it and apply it and repeat. We must do that if we are going to grow, if we are going to be like Christ. If we are going to do what Jesus commands us to do in Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and following, and love our enemies, and then the outflow of that is we watch the life of Christ, and we watch his example to the disciples, and we watch his commands to us all throughout his living testimony here on this earth. If we're going to do that, then we better receive it, apply it, and repeat over and over and over again. Since Jesus commands us to love our enemies, what's that supposed to look like? What's it supposed to look like? Well, last Lord's Day, we began with just the first description. Love is patient. This is the first of two things that love is. Don't you find it interesting that there's only two things that, that the Apostle Paul writes here that describe what love is? The rest tell us what love does or what love doesn't do or what love isn't, but these two tell us what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Remember patient, what the word means in its expression of love? That we are willing, that we willingly, under the care of God, under the watch care of God, we willingly will receive the enemies actions against us whatever that might be the enemy is just someone who opposes us that's what the word means it's simply an, an oppressor someone who opposes who you are that we willingly receive that kind of hurt it might be emotional hurt it might be some kind of sentimental hurt it might even be physical hurt after all christ was killed 
was reading today about ten, or this week about William Tyndale, who one of the men and the reasons why you hold in your hands an English translated Bible, who was burned at the stake after he was strangled at the stake, burned at the stake simply because he didn't believe what the Catholics were saying about purgatory and other things in the Bible that they tried to attach to the Bible. He was killed for that. Patiently allowing God to do whatever God would have his life be used for without the desire to retaliate. That's patience. That's patient love. The word literally means to suffer long. In other words, biblical love, right, the exercise of Christian patience is the ability to be wronged by others the ability to be opposed, to be stepped on by others and then wronged again by others and then wronged again by others and then wronged again by others and all the while, while you have the ability and the sinfulness in you to retaliate in some sinful kind of way, you do not retaliate, you never even think of retaliating. That's what he means. Love is patience. When we love as Christ loved, when God is honored by our love, when others know that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ because of our love for one another, they see our patience. They see that exercised when we are wronged. Number two says love is kind. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. If God is love, then God is kind. If we are to be imitators of God, then we need to be kind. And so, true biblical kindness is an act of love. Remember, these are action words. These are not adjectives. These are not descriptions. These are actually what love is by its essence. These are described. These are actions that love carries out or does not carry out. So, biblical kindness is an act of love. And kindness is actually the other side of the coin of patience. say, what do you mean? Well, biblical patience is long-suffering. That means it endures the injuries of others without retaliation or the desire for retaliation. And biblical kindness, when you flip the coin over, pays back those who inflicted hurt upon you, not with sinful retaliation, but rather it pays them back with good deeds. Jesus said, love your enemies be kind to those who hurt you. Be kind to those who are hateful to you. Jesus says in Luke 27, do good to those who hate you. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. What's he saying? He's saying be patient and be kind to them. Be patient with them and be kind to them. So listen, long-suffering says, I'll receive... I'll receive from you by God's grace, knowing that I'm under his watch care, that God is sovereign in my life. I will receive from you any hurt that you bring into my life, whatever that might be. And kindness says, I'll, by God's grace, knowing that I am under his watch care, that he cares for my life in all kinds of ways, that I will do only what is useful for the need of you who are my enemy. That's what the root word of kindness means, useful, useful. Love your enemies. How? Be patient with your enemies. Be useful to your enemies. So to be kind, as described by love here, is to say and to act in a way that will be of use to my enemy. I don't want to be useful to my enemy, Lord. <laughs> Do you want to be useful to me, Jesus says? Then be kind to your enemy. I was reminded this week of Jesus Christ himself standing, standing under his trial. The officers are there. They are challenging Jesus Christ. 
They are bringing accusation against him. Pilate is there. Jesus has been scourged. He's been, he's been hit with the, the weapons of the day in order that he might be, hopefully in their minds, learn to not do what he's doing. The soldiers put a crown of thorns on his head in John chapter 19. They array a purple robe around him and they start to mock him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they give him blows to his face. They keep hitting him. And Pilate comes out again and he says to the crowd, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know I find no guilt in him. And so Jesus comes out. He's wearing the crown of thorns. Blood is dripping down his face. He's got the purple robe on. Pilate says to him, Behold the man mockingly to the crowd. And the chief priests, the religious people, the officers of the day cry out, crucify him. Pilate says, you take him, you crucify him because I don't find any guilt in him. And Jesus, the Jews say, no, we can't do that. It's against our law, we can't do that. We have a law that he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. Pilate says, therefore, when he heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He enters the inner room, the praetorium, and he says to Jesus, where are you from? Jesus doesn't answer. Why? Because Jesus had answered plenty of times before that. He didn't need to give an answer. Pilate knew exactly where he was from. Pilate, therefore, said to him, you don't speak to me? Are you kidding me? You're a prisoner here. You don't speak to me. You don't, don't you know I have the authority to release you and I have the authority to crucify you? Here is a man created by the very one standing before him and he says, listen, don't you know who I am? I can give you freedom or I can give you death and you don't want to talk to me. Who do you think you are? Jesus, in his kindness, says, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Jesus says, Pilate, you may do all that wickedness to me, but you have to understand something. We stand here both under a greater sovereignty than you will ever think about. You wouldn't have anything that you're doing if the one who sent me to you didn't give it to you What kind words, kind words to an enemy. To be kind, to be kind to our enemy is to say and act in a way that will be of use to them. In other words, to live my life to the benefit of others. In an ultimate sense, it's to live and to do for them so that they might know Jesus Christ, so that they might be a witness to who Christ is, so that my life might be a witness to who Christ is, so that they, in my life, whether it be in living or in dying, they might see Christ in me. So this kindness isn't normally what we think when we think about kindness. When my kids were younger, they would do something, they would be treating one another in sibling rivalries as you find so often in homes with multiple kids. And we would say to them, listen, you need to be kind. You need to act kindly with your siblings. We'd ask them at times, how, how are you supposed to treat one another? And their response would be, kindly. And we'd say, well, great, that's a great answer, but what does that look like? What does kindness look like in actions towards one another? Because when it says here that love is kind, it's talking about a action, not just a nice disposition. It's talking about doing and saying something useful to and useful for someone else's benefit. Love gives itself a way to help somebody. That's what it does. Love is kind. It, it gives itself a way to help somebody. And here, the implication is, by the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6, and us tying it back to Paul's words to the Corinthian church, it's to do something useful to an enemy. 
Love your enemies. Do good to them. In other words, be self-sacrificing in your unretaliating and be useful to them. He didn't say, hey, listen, guys, when you meet the enemies, just have a nice disposition with them. He didn't say that, although disposition certainly is involved with that. No, he's saying, regardless of what they do to you, you love them. You do good things for your enemies. That's shocking to me because the Apostle Paul is writing these words. He isn't writing these words to people who are being nice to one another. And they're not having a good disposition and living this out in their Christian life. This is a bunch of people who have real angst towards one another. They're, they're taking one another to court. They're fighting to the point where even on the minor things, they're going to the law about it. These are backbiting people, people hurting one another. It isn't even outside the church. It's inside the church. And Paul is saying, listen, in the very difficult circumstances of a sinful, selfish world, in the difficult circumstances that come within a sinful and selfish church, even that's filled with Christians, in the hard environment of the world in which we live, where the negative influences are all around us and tempting us with their definitions of love and how they think that we ought to be, in homes where it seems that love has walked out the door and there isn't love anymore in the home, these are the places where the atmosphere in which the true character of love will be so clearly seen. You want to see love shine bright? then drop it in on the backdrop of sinful ugliness. You want to see love? The Bible says it this way, 1 John 4, verse 10. In this is love. Well, that's a nice way to start. Great. We'll find out what it is. Here it is. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the satisfaction for our sins. That's love. Not that, that we liked God. Not that we had a good disposition for God. In fact, the Bible says we were enemies of God. And yet God, even though we were His enemies, He loved us and He sent a sacrifice for us so that we wouldn't have to pay an eternity under His wrath. He did what was eternally, spiritually beneficial for us. So let me ask us this question this morning. Are you kind to others? Everything was good, Pastor, until you said that. I took notes diligently. I wrote it down. Oh, it's good. Oh, man, i got to make sure so-and-so hears this. Are you kind with others? Uh, is your first thought in dealing with others... What can I do that would be useful for them? That, that person that's attempting and is opposing me, what can I do that might be useful for them? Are we kind? Or is our response when we're irritated, how can I get back at them? I'm not going to let them get away with this. I just won't have anything to do with them anymore. It's over, done. Cut them off, send them away. You see, if our response is the second, it's not biblical love. And if we say we love God and we're responding that way, guess what? We're not loving God either. No matter what we might say. Love says, how can I repay their hurt with something useful, with something that would be good for their need? So are you kind? How about the first one? Are you patient? You've thought about that for a whole week. Are you patient like it's described here? Are you willing to suffer wrong? 
without the desire to retaliate. Maybe you say, I was willing to suffer wrong, but man, it was that second part that's harder. You better believe it's harder because it's Christ-like. That's why he gave us the Spirit. So that we could say, I can, rather than I won't. See, our only right retaliation is to be kind. Love is patient, right? The willingness to, to endure without retaliation. The only right retaliation is kindness. So we can be the best Christians on the outside. We can have this, this nice facade built up on the outside. We can be busier in the church than anybody else. We can be going around like an ant on the ant hill, eating and moving all the sugar that we want, offer ourselves to be useful in every kind of ministry, always be the person that's first asked, got their hand up. We can be that kind of person. We can have all the skills that we want. We can do all the things better than everyone else. But if you do not love, it means that you have a big zero before God. It helps no one. Jesus says, love your enemies. Why? Because that's what followers of mine do. They're like me. They love their enemies. That's what Christians do. Therefore, be non-retaliatory in your patience. Be useful in your kindness. Number three, love is not jealous. Love is not jealous. What is love? Love is patient. Love is kind. What is love not? Love is not jealous. It is not jealous. Some of your Bibles use the word envy. Envy is just a synonym for jealousy. Now, when we think of jealousy, we need to understand that there are Two primary ways in which jealousy is expressed. One lies on the surface, and the other one's deep-seated. I think you can get the idea from the words of Solomon in Proverbs 14.30. He says, a tranquil heart is life to the body... Right, a settledness inside, an understanding of who God is and who you are. It's life to the body. It settles you. But jealousy is rottenness to the bones. Jealousy will destroy you. So a surface kind of jealousy looks at others and says to itself, I want what you have. That's a surface jealousy. It's a, it's a part of covetousness. Right? I want what you have. It looks at others in comparison and wants their things, whatever that might be. It wants their life. It wants the, the greener grass, if you will. Whatever it might be, it wants it. That's jealousy. I'm jealous of you. We know what that's like. You know why? Because we are jealous at times. We all have at one time or another been superficially jealous of what another person has or what they appear to be or what they appear to have. It might be a position that they have. You, you want that. It might be a title they have. You want that. It might be prominence they have. It might be something like that. It might be a material thing they have. You want it. That's jealousy. I want what you have. And let's mark it. That's sin. That's just flat out sin. Right? It's saying to God, I don't, I don't uh, think you've done what, I, what I, you should have done for my life. Somebody else has got the things that I think I should have, and therefore I want them. And so I'm saying to you, Lord, you need to provide that for me, or you're not doing what you said. That's surface jealousy, but that's not deep-seated jealousy. Jealousy. No jealousy is good, and jealousy left unchecked, even surface jealousy, can root itself down and become that deep-seated jealousy. But the deep-seated jealousy says, not only I wish I had what you have, but deep-seated jealousy goes a bit further, and it says, and I don't want you to have it either. I want what you have, and I'm going to do what I need to to make sure you don't have it either. That's the jealousy that's deep inside. You not only want it, but you don't want the other person to have it. It's easy, sadly, it's easy for us to have that in our heart. 
Just think about it for a moment. Someone doing something maybe that you do. Maybe you have a skill and somebody else comes along and they do it better than you. Immediately you think to yourself, well, that's not as good as me. I do it better than that. I'm better than they are. I could have done it better. It's very hard for us as people because of our sinful tendencies. It's hard to rejoice over somebody who does exactly what you do, but they do it better. It's hard for us to rejoice with others like that, especially if it's going to take the light off of us. If somebody else is going to be praised more than us, we don't like that. Why? Because we love to be praised. That's why when we speak of jealousy, we immediately understand what we're talking about. It doesn't take a lot of explanation for us to understand what jealousy is because we do it. It's easy to be jealous. Jonathan Edwards called it the spirit of dissatisfaction with the prosperity and happiness of others. I like that. Spirit of dissatisfaction. The root word for jealousy means to boil. That's the idea, to boil. You say, wow, love is patient, love is kind. Love doesn't boil. In other words, there's no... There's nothing with love that has this internal steaming over somebody else's success. This is exactly what was happening in the Corinthian church. They were acting with jealousy. You say, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? Because notice at the end of verse or chapter 12, verse 31, Paul says, earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I'll show you still more, a more excellent way. That word earnestly desires the same word used in chapter 13 for jealous. Jealous. So Paul isn't saying, hey, listen, be jealous of one another for the, for the great gifts. He's not saying that. He's saying the problem with you is that you are actually jealous of certain people and their giftedness, and you want it also. And in fact, you don't want them to have it so that you can have all the praise. He said, but what you should be internally steaming for is the greatest of the realities, and that is love. Love. Paul says, it really doesn't matter what I have. Remember the first three verses? If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. I'm just noise. If I have a gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and the knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I don't have love, guess what? It's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. You can praise me all you want, but God isn't impressed. If I give all my possession to feed the poor, if I'm the greatest philanthropist around that's ever lived and I deliver the bo my body to be burned, I say, okay, now take me and I'll be burned at the stake, but I don't have love. Zero, big zero. For God, that means nothing. Everybody stands around and claps, and that's it. You get nothing. Why? Because love is not jealous. When love sees somebody who's gifted or somebody who's more prosperous or somebody who's more popular, it doesn't covet what they have. That's not love. It doesn't wish they, that person didn't have it. That's not biblical love. No, when biblical love sees that, it's happy for them, and it gives thanks to God for them. That's what biblical love does. It rejoices in what God is doing. But jealousy just destroys. Jealousy is such a destructive sin. I mean, we, you don't get very long into the scriptures in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, and you find jealousy there. Eve in the garden, Satan says to her, listen, don't you want to be like God? I mean, take a look at God. God doesn't want you to be like him. He knows that once you eat that fruit, you're going to be like him. Don't you want to be like him? Listen, Eve, be jealous. Fulfill your jealous desire. 
Go for it. Get it yourself. Eat of it. Cain expressed the same jealousy over his brother Abel. Sacrificed before God and out of his own jealous heart, he murders his brother. God liked your sacrifice more than mine. No, really what it was is God saw the heart. Your heart's wicked and evil. It didn't want to go to God, didn't want to honor God, so you brought what you brought. So he killed me. Killed his brother. Pharisees were the same way. They killed Christ because of jealousy in their heart. Listen, look at all the people going to him. We can't have that. Jealousy is such a destructive sin. In fact, James tells us some very instructive words concerning this very truth. James 3 Verse 13, following, he says this. Now, get this. This is shocking. Who among you is wise and understanding? Right, that's, a, that's a great question. Who, who's wise? Well, you know, we all like to think we're doing pretty well. We have understanding. We're not doing so bad. It's a rhetorical question, right? Who among you is wise and understanding? Okay, here you go. Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. All right, if you want to say you're wise and of understanding, then, then let your actions be that which is the outflow of wisdom, gentle wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Don't say you're wise and of understanding if that's the way in which you think, in which you live. I want his. I don't want them to have it. I want to be preeminent. I'm the person who needs to be first. Don't lie against the truth. The truth says otherwise. Because that kind of wisdom is not that which comes down from above. It is earthly. It is natural. Get this. It is demonic. Demonic. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. James 3, verse 16. So biblical love can't be jealous. Biblical love cannot be jealous. You understand what I'm saying? If there's jealousy existing, that is not biblical love. Biblical love cannot be jealous because jealousy is a quality of Satan. It is demonic. It's demonic. So when we are jealous, we are acting like the father of lies. We are acting like Satan. No wonder it causes so much trouble. He's the usurper, the great deceiver, the great troublemaker. No wonder there's so much heartache in people's lives and in the church when jealousy arises. So love is not jealous and also, and I want to take these next two together in verse 4, because they're dealing with the same thing, just in two different ways. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. So between what love is not, love is not jealous, and love is not arrogant, the Apostle Paul sticks something that love does not do, and then he picks up in verse 5, at the other things of what love does not do. And then at the end of verse, or in the middle of verse 5, he adds in the third thing that love is not. It is not provoked. But I just want to take these first two. Love does not brag, is not arrogant. Love is not, if you want to say brag, is boastful. That's what brag really kind of the idea. And love isn't arrogant. We might say prideful. Love isn't boastful or prideful. So on the one side, you have speech, the outworkings of the mouth, and then the other side, you have an attitude. You have an attitude, a thought about yourself. Love does not brag, meaning love will never puff itself up. Love is never the greatest champion of the person expressing love. Love doesn't do that. In other words, it never seeks to applaud itself. Never, love never thinks itself as being above somebody else. Love never says, 
in your own mind, in your own words, I'm above you. It's a very interesting term here for boastful or brag. Love doesn't brag. It's a very interesting term because it has its root in the meaning of airbag. Airbag, I like that. I like that. Love isn't its own windbag. It's not its own airbag. Love isn't shooting off its mouth about its own accomplishments. Love doesn't do that. Ever heard people do that? Oh, look at me. I'm the greatest of ever. I mean, we've had people do that. In fact, this is very interesting because we, we just see how love is, right? Love doesn't envy. Love is not jealous, it says. In other words, love doesn't desire what you have. And here's another side of that. Love doesn't act in such a way so as to tempt you to want what I have. Doesn't brag. Doesn't brag. It doesn't act in such a way whereby you would be tempted to want what I have. Doesn't go around saying, hey, look at me. I'm somebody. It doesn't brag. Bragging is that. It's that you, me syndrome. It's that here you are and here I am. You're lowering me. As long as I can keep you lowering me, I feel good about myself. We know what that is. You tell a story of some accomplishment in your life, somebody else comes along and says, hey, guess what? Yeah, that's really nice, but I did it better. Here's what I did. Right? It's the you-me syndrome. Love doesn't act that way. Why? Because love doesn't brag. Love doesn't brag. Nor is love arrogant. Nor is love arrogant. Love is not prideful about what it does. Nobody likes to be around a boastful, prideful person. All you want to do is get away from them. That was part of the Corinthian church problem. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of this guy. Oh, this is who I listen to. This is mine. Oh, look at me. It's all about me. Nobody likes that. They were totally inconsiderate of each other constantly fighting for public attention, constantly wanting to be first. Their services were just chaos. People would walk in the church and it would be chaos. Just think about what it would be like if, if we gathered here on a Sunday, we all came to church, and during our morning time, during our morning service, anyone and everyone who had some kind of giftedness in some kind of area, whether it's musical or whether it's speaking or whatever it is, all the <coughs> giftedness, we all got up at the same time and everybody's trying to exercise their gift to the maximum extent all at the same time. And then you have somebody who doesn't know the church, a visitor comes into the church and they see all that going on. They shake their head and go, what are these wackies doing? It's all chaos. All they see is jealousy and arrogance being portrayed. It's disastrous. You say, really, it's that bad? Yeah, look at chapter 14, verse 23. Paul says, if therefore the whole church should assemble together and all, all speak in tongues and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, what are they going to say? You're mad. You guys are out of your minds. That's exactly what happened. That's why Paul says, listen, there's a more excellent way. There's a more excellent way. What is that? It's the way of love. It's the way of love. That's why he says in verse 12 of chapter 13, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now in part, but then we shall see fully because we, we've also been fully known. But now, right now, there's faith, there's hope and love. There's these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the outworking. Love is the, the visible picture. Love, love, love looks out, and, and it's the outworking of faith and hope. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It does not brag, and it is not arrogant. Apostle Paul could have just stopped right there, I think, had he not been being led by the Spirit. He could have just put a period there, ended it, and just said this statement at the end. Love is like Christ. Love is like Christ. Right? Who for the joy set before him, it says in 1 Peter, he endured the cross, despising the shame. 
Jesus Christ, who was reviled in every way, who was maligned in every way, who was persecuted in every way, who was injured in every way, who went to the cross for us, did not revile in return, spoke no threats to him, but kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. Is it any wonder Paul would say in Philippians 2, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? Be imitators of God, Ephesians 5, verse 1. Although Christ existed in the form of God, although he could have stayed there, he didn't regard that something to be tightly held to, but he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Even at the hands of sinful men, you and I there in the hands of those sinners nailing Christ to the cross. We ought to consider him. You want to love like Christ? Then consider Christ. You want your love to be patient, your love to be kind, your love to not be jealous, your love to not brag and not be arrogant? Then look to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Look to Christ. If we're going to love as Christ, then we better fix our eyes on Christ. Well, but that's what Jesus is commanding in Luke chapter 6. That's what he's commanding in Luke chapter 6. Remember how he began. Blessed are you who are poor. He's not talking about economics. He's talking about spiritual. You come bankrupt before the Lord. You have nothing to offer. You come poor to Christ. You come begging for mercy to Christ. And yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now because you realize your lack. You go to Christ and you hunger for his righteousness because you have none of your own. And you go to Christ and God satisfies you. You shall be satisfied. And you mourn over your sin. You weep over your sin. You you know where you're sinful. And you go to Christ. And you you beg for Christ. You thank Him for His mercy. And you, you thank Him for His forgiveness. You weep now and you shall laugh. Because you understand the forgiveness of God. And you are so glad for that. And because of where you stand with Christ, you can bless those who hate you and who ostracize you and who cast insults at you and spurn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man because you walk with Christ, because you're a Christian, because you stand for Christ, because you stand on the truth of the Word of God, because you live like Christ, you're going to be hated. Jesus says, be glad in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. So I say to you who hear, verse 27, love your enemies. Jesus says, be like me. That's what he's saying. Be like me. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. How are we going to do that? Fix our eyes on Christ. Remember Christ and his love for us so that we might love each other as he has loved us. You bow with me in a word of prayer. Father, as we think about these words and the weight of them upon our hearts, help us to also be mindful that without the Spirit it's impossible, but with the Spirit it is possible that we can love like this. We can respond in these ways. We can think in these ways. We can be imitators of God. You have equipped us by your spirit to do what you have asked us to do. We hear your words. We hear your commands. Help us in that to submit ourselves to your leading through your word as we walk in the spirit. When we do, we will not carry out the deeds of the flesh. Your name will be glorified. Others will see Jesus Christ in us. And all we desire to hear from you is well done, good and faithful servant. 
even if that means, Lord, that we are entering into your eternal rest because someone hates us to that extent. Help us to love like that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.